We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best in class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one on one long term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. How do we create a community of compassion the same way we created a community of consumption? We invested massively in it. From Offscript Media, I am Matthew Zachary, and this is Out of Patience. On today's show, one of the single most influential human beings of my career, Dan Pallotta, champion of charity and the entire nonprofit business sector. Dan's take on how we as a culture think about charity the wrong way planted a bedrock philosophy in my head for how I was going to grow and lead stupid cancer to scalable success without the pitfalls of donors complaining about overhead. I'll give you money, but don't spend it on electricity. God forbid you don't have internet or you need internet to do things. Yes, thank you, donor, for that fabulous conversation. Good talk, son. Dan's much ballyhooed book, Uncharitable, How Restraints on Nonprofits Undermine Their Potential, has a new, more digestible schoolhouse rock version called The Everyday Philanthropist that I, Matthew Zachary, encourage every single nonprofit board member, staff member, and donor to read immediately, if not sooner. My favorite quote from Dan, human, kind, be bold. And now without further ado, Dan Pallotta. Dan Pallotta, thank you so much for coming on my show. I would say this is your third appearance on my show, but this is your first appearance on this show because we had spoken in the past on the Stupid Cancer Show at large, not even debating, but consistently agreeing on all of the philosophies and structures you brought to the consciousness about the challenges of even understanding what the words nonprofit means. And before I have you respond, my first introduction to you was your TED Talk in 2013, where you started by saying the following words, being gay and fathering triplets is by far the most socially innovative and socially entrepreneurial thing I've ever done. (laughs) My goodness, how do I not know this man? I read all your books and we just became like bros that day. I think it's important to go back and examine how prescient and timely and necessary that TED Talk was. There's a conversation about this now, and there wasn't before. I think we've made a lot of improvement. Six weeks after I gave that TED Talk, three of the big evaluators, Better Business Bureau Wise, Giving Alliance, Charity Navigator, and GuideStar got together and issued a joint press release in which they essentially told the general public, stop asking about overhead. Overhead isn't the best way to measure a charity's performance. We need to be measuring impact, and a lot of charities... They actually said many charities should spend more on overhead. I mean, that was like hell freezing over, you know. (laughs) Yes. Um, (laughs) That press release came out the same week the Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. So I thought I was like living in an alternate universe or something. Wow. All this change was happening. And a couple months ago, five of the big foundations, MacArthur, Open Society, Ford, Hewlett, got together and said, we're going to start funding overhead at a much higher rate to destigmatize the whole notion of overhead. Darren Walker wrote a beautiful piece in which he said that this whole overhead thing has been a charade and the Ford Foundation has been a participant in it. So that's probably more than I could have dreamed 
would have happened as a result of this conversation. That said, we've got a long way to go. So there's broad consciousness at the level of institutional funders now that you really want to be looking at impact and not overhead. It's not 100%. I would say, I don't know if the saturation of that is greater than 50%, even at the foundation level. At the level of the nonprofit organization itself, I'd say there's low saturation there. I'd say most nonprofits are still driven by their fear of keeping overhead low. And at the level of the general public, I'd say there's no saturation. You can go out and ask 100 people on the street, how do you decide which charity to give to? And they'll, they'll say that, you know, the ones with the lowest overhead and that don't pay their CEOs very much, those are the best charities. So there's a long way to go. I, I would say we are with this conversation where gay marriage was in the 1940s, not the 1980s, not the 1970s, not the 1950s, the 1940s, the notion that gays could marry is becoming an idea, but it's nowhere near being broadly adopted or not controversial. It is really fascinating that the perception is still, you know, I'm going to make a donation to this charity, but I don't want to pay for your electric bill because God forbid you don't have electricity and you can't do your job. It fascinates me to no end that that is common perception amongst donors. I will comment that having been introduced to your work and your book and your activism in the AIDS movement and, and how you were able to, you know, let's spend money to make money works in for-profit, but it's anathema in non-profit. I, I made a lot of conscious decisions in trying to build Stupid Cancer to almost intentionally not be donor dependent, kind of like to just avoid the whole conversation in general. And most of our revenue came from business partnerships and corporate sponsorships and uh, social good relationships and e-commerce. And we did live events. And I almost feel like I didn't solve the problem. I avoided it. Have you seen any organizations in the nonprofit space that have taken up this heed, like worked head on into their donor community and got conscious shifting in the way that they give? Yeah, I've seen Charity Water do it. Charity Water set up a separate board to fund overhead so they can tell the general public 100% of your money goes to the cause. So what they've proven is that at a very high dollar figure, they can convince a lot of people to give all of their money to overhead. Unfortunately, what they are doing at the same time is teaching the general public that zero overhead is an expectation the public should have. And so they've sort of avoided the problem as well at the general public level. And I think sooner or later, we're going to have to tackle the problem at the level of the general public because 75% of the money coming to nonprofits comes from individual donors. So that's where the big money is. That's where the big gains are to be made. So we've got to change the way the general public thinks. You know, I was in um, Charlotte giving a speech one day. They have massive problems with economic mobility there, you know, huge divide between the rich and the poor and no ability to move from one to the other, worse than the nation. And so they commissioned a huge study, universities, consultants, nonprofit sector, government. And on the cover of this big, thick report, they had a question, which was, how do we create a community of caring? As if that was a really difficult question yeah. to answer, right? <laughs> yes. Like, as if that's not going to get answered in our lifetime, but it's time that we pose it. And I don't think that's a difficult question to answer at all. I think that's a really easy question to answer. How do we create a community of compassion the same way we created a community of consumption? We invested massively in it, trillions and trillions of dollars, and we continue to invest hundreds of billions of dollars a year in advertising and marketing to get the general public to consume. Day after day after day, we're indoctrinating the general public in consumption. You go into Times Square, look at the gigantic billboards for Coca-Cola and for Apple and for Microsoft and for Disney. Walk down Main Street, look at the big beautiful Apple stores and the, you know, the subway stores and the AT&T stores, just constant indoctrination everywhere we go. You know, when I was a kid, I used to love to draw logos. What logos was I drawing? I was drawing the 7-Up logo and the Coca-Cola logo and the STP logo. 
I wasn't drawing the Red Cross logo or the Oxfam logo. Why? Because I was never seeing them. At the youngest age, I was being indoctrinated in consumption. Country music, you ever watch the Ken Burns series? The radio stations that grew up with these 50,000-watt towers, the reason they built those towers was to sell insurance and cigarettes and flour to the general public, and they needed some content to keep the general public attentive. So country music was the content to keep them attentive so they could sell them cigarettes and flour and insurance. And if we think we're somehow going to get to some glorious, compassionate culture without investing in a counterbalance of indoctrination, we are living in a fool's paradise. So it's not a difficult answer to see how we get to a more compassionate society. But if you keep telling charities, you can't spend any money on advertising, you can't do what Coca-Cola does, you can't do what Tide detergent does, you can't do what Apple does, then we're going to have the same messed up society that we have. And we're seeing it in all of its glory right now. So it's up to the general public to start to say, I want to see a different world. I want to build a world of love and compassion and generosity. And I want charities to take the lead on it. I want them to start filling my mailbox and my billboards with message about love and handholding and support and nurturing enough of beer and potato chips. You had brought up a very salient issue that the nonprofit sector kind of fills the gap where the private sector sees no financial gain. Is there any middle ground in terms of, I know that whole B Corp thing came and went or whatever it is. Have you seen any hybrid solutions in public-private relationships where that brand exposure, that cause gets integrated into your cultural psyche so you're aware of it and yet you still need to buy toilet paper? I mean, the AIDS rides and the breast cancer three days. The AIDS rides were sponsored by Tangare. The breast cancer three days were sponsored by Avon, the cosmetics company. They provided the capital that allowed us to do the advertising at big scale. Like we were taking out full page ads in the New York Times in full color on Sunday, page one of the arts and leisure section, right? Tangare paid for that ad. Avon was loaning us money to buy full page ads in the New York Times and the Boston Globe and the Washington Post, primetime radio and TV. And we called it the Avon Breast Cancer Three Days. So there was a double win, right? And we raised net $194 million in five years as a result of being able to advertise the breast cancer three-day walk the same way Avon got to advertise Skin So Soft Moisturizer. Are there any nonprofits today that are doing advertising that are present? I would put an asterisk next to foundations associated with major corporations like the Ford Foundation. Are there examples of this? Is there any version of the Avon AIDS walk that you did in the 90s today? Well, interestingly, there are some organizations that we know and love, like, you know, Save the Children or World Vision, and they're enormous in the billions of dollars a year. And World Vision got to that scale through direct response television advertising. Now, massive buyers of direct response television, you know, the kind of ad you see late at night on cable that says, you know, it's a half an hour thing, you know, call 800 World Vision and help support a child. I mean, I've been doing right. one of those for 30, 40 years. How did they circumvent the high cost of fundraising? I think it's in part because they're a quasi-religious organization and religious organizations have not, ironically, typically been as obsessed with overhead ratios, but also because they've got big government support and big major gift support and big foundation support that allows them to amortize the high cost of the television fundraising over other low cost methods to come up with an overall low cost ratio. But yeah, there are absolutely examples of it. This is not something that needs to be theorized. You know, if people know about a good cause, do they donate to it more? <laughs> absolutely. I yeah. mean, Hurricane Katrina, this earthquake, that earthquake, whatever tsunami, like when it floods the news, when our consciousness is full of it, we donate hundreds of millions of dollars to those things. So this isn't rocket science. We just need to stop prohibiting charities from talking. We have silenced charities. We have censored them. We don't want you to spend any of my money getting other people interested in this cause. <laughs> I want you to depend on me 100%, right? That's essentially what we're saying. Don't advertise to go find new donors. Depend on me. 
It's the charitable sector that's responsible for creating a stronger civil society. Other than getting people to vote, other than candidates getting people to vote, there's no other part of civilization charted with strengthening civil society. But if you can't talk to civil society, if you can't really spend any significant money on advertising, if you got to always use donated advertising, then you can't build a stronger civil society. You can't get more people involved. You can't create more heroism. So I just want to make this easy for your listeners to understand. Look out in the world. You know, go online right now, you know, go on to Google search and see how many ads you see for for profit products. Go on to your favorite news site. See how many ads you see for for profit products. Do you see any for nonprofits? No. Why? Because we won't let them spend money on that. Guess what you have as a result of that? You have a world hell bent on consumption. Back with our guest after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. Let's talk to some of the folks that listen to my show that are nonprofit founders and they're in the realm of less than a hundred thousand a year. I, I tend to be, you know, not so kind or kind to the shit happened. I'm gonna start the shit happened foundation because shit happened versus is there an institutional path of growth when most nonprofits make less than a hundred thousand a year and three quarters of them go out of business after three years. What do you say to the struggling, I want to make a difference, but the big box nonprofit that I really want to go after who doesn't want to do anything with me because they're territorial, and yet there's a need I need to fill? I say, look at Elon Musk. Did he let the existence of General Motors and Toyota stop him from starting Tesla? Did he wait for their permission? Did he cooperate with them? No. He created, there's this famous quote attributed to Michelangelo, criticized by creating. And that's exactly what Elon Musk is doing. Did Elon Musk let NASA stop him from designing his own rocket? Did Steve Jobs let the existence of the BlackBerry and the Palm smart devices stop him from introducing the iPhone? Did Last Mile Health, you know, Raj Punjabi, did he let the existence of big box nonprofits stop him from starting that innovation? Andrew Yoon and One Acre Fund, did he let them stop him from doing that? Crisis Text Line, which is kind of in hot water right now, but yeah. did they let the existing big box mental health nonprofits stop them from introducing a text-oriented innovation? So, you know, don't let that stop you. The big change almost always comes from the outside. Don't start without trying, you know, see if they'll cooperate with you. But then if they won't, Create something new. The world needs innovation. And surround and get your team literate. Like get your team, your board and your staff literate. Um, You know, I'll just plug it. Have your entire team do the bold training online that I just created. You know, it's three and a half hours of content. It will spin their heads around. Have everyone on your team for an hour read The Everyday Philanthropist. Like establish literacy. What we've achieved in the last 10 years or so is we've gotten the leaders of organizations literate to some extent. We've gotten the leaders of organizations to understand, hey, this paradigm that I operate in is broken. Now, step two is taking that out beyond the individual leader to the entire staff and the entire board. And from then, from there to the entire country. And I started to see people would come to my speeches and my trainings, and then they would leave and they would try and repeat what I said. and That's like me trying to sing like Freddie Mercury, you know, like better to have a Queen album. And so I decided, look, I can't expect these people to become experts in this stuff the way I am. I speak about this stuff day in and day out. Why don't I 
create some tools where I'm speaking for them, you know, online learning tools, short books that are easy to understand. So they don't have to get to my level of proficiency to change the way their donors and their staff think they can, they can use me in book and video form. So I think that's the next step. You know, it sounds wonky. It doesn't sound sexy, but donor literacy, staff, board, and donor literacy, that's the big structural behemoth that we need to make progress on. You mentioned Crisis Text Line. We worked with them at Stupid Cancer because if we ever saw anything on our social listings that would be relevant, we would refer people to them immediately and we would coach them through that. We weren't social workers, obviously. I want to get to Everyday Philanthropist and and your book. And thank you for bringing up Boulder Board, which you've renamed. And I think it's really critical. I would recommend, and I have, if I am not your disciple already, I am now your official disciple. Everyone (laughs) that runs a nonprofit needs to read this book, take this training course. It is insanely valuable. I would love your thoughts on one specific aspect of charity, and that is the tangible charities versus the intangible charities. And specifically in my space where I was is it was a little mental health, but it was psychosocial support and navigation to resources and how to make your quality of life a lot better. It wasn't Habitat, building houses. It wasn't Doctors Without Border. There was nothing you could really put your finger on to say your dollar goes here. And that conflates and conflicts and works indirectly with and without the idea of overhead because everything we did was overhead. Programmatic stuff was like, oh, we had an event. But events seem to be very tangibly individualized and interstitial and you're done with it. It happens and it's done. From the perspective of we're going to build this many houses, we're going to impact you know, this many bottles of water, we're going to build this many wells, we're going to save these many farms. What's your thought on the nonprofits, even outside of healthcare, that do things that can't be counted on a hand for impact? You've got to find some way. You know, it could be, all right, we're, we're a mental health charity. Well, let's start with just outputs. How many people did we touch? Okay, is that increasing? All right, now what's the quality of that interaction? Well, you might say, well, I don't know. How would I know the quality of that interaction? Well, one way might be to survey people. You know, one of the things that Wounded Warrior Project did was they did customer satisfaction surveys the way Apple does customer sat surveys on the iPhone. And they had 90% plus customer service satisfaction on their mental health programs, on their job training programs, on their sports programs. You know, use qualitative information what kind of qualitative statements are what percentage of people making about our programs? Can they name any improvements they've seen in their lives and then start to quantify those things? If you get to something like cancer research, it becomes much more difficult. Then I think you have to rely on not effectiveness. This is kind of wonky, but look, you shouldn't, you shouldn't ask about overhead. And ironically, you shouldn't ask about just effectiveness. Because if you just ask about effectiveness, you'll find charities saying, oh, yeah, we're really effective at serving soup to the homeless. We served a thousand bowls of soup last week alone, which then you're not doing anything to actually end homelessness because you're just obsessed with this easy measure. Like a cancer lab, a cancer research institution, what are, what are your goals? Ask them, what are your goals? What progress are you making toward those goals? And how do you measure it? And how do you improve? So you know, if it was Jonas Salk, look, I'm not going to measure your effectiveness a year before you find the polio vaccine. You're, you're not effective at all. But what I want to know is, what is the nature of your experiments? Do you measure them? And what do you do with the data? Do you keep learning? And do you keep changing based on the learning? Can you show me some intention to learn and improve? That's what's important. Yeah. And it also speaks to how donors usually want instant return on their contribution. They don't want to donate and hope one day in six years, you know, it's like investors, you know, you do a seed round, a series A, those investors expect to return, but they're willing to wait X amount of years for that return. That philosophy does not work in the nonprofit sector because donors make a donation and they expect the house to be built the next day. Yeah. Which is why I said donor literacy, donor literacy, donor literacy. You know, teaching donors that we've got to get more people involved, we've got to get more donors, that costs money. The solutions to these problems happen over the long term, not the short term. If you want a short term result, you're going to have long term problems here forever. Donor literacy, because they don't understand that. You know, what is the average donor doing with their day? They're taking care of their family, they're taking care of their health, 
They're um, investing in their own career. They don't have time to think about the economics of the nonprofit sector, the mechanics of impact and improvement and progress in the nonprofit sector. And if we don't teach them, they're never going to learn. So, you know, over and over again, just it's about donor literacy. We teach people, I don't know how well they remember it. We teach them that there are three branches of government. You know, we teach them about the executive and the legislative and the judicial. We teach them that there are two houses of Congress. We got to start to teach them about what it actually takes for a nonprofit to produce results. And it isn't the things you've been taught superficially by the media. A nonprofit that keeps its overhead low and keeps its salaries low is not the nonprofit that's going to change the world. I mean, think about that. Do you want the football team that pays the coach the least amount of money? Do you want the Yankees? Do you, do, you want, do you want to be a fan of the Major League Baseball team that pays the pitcher the least amount of money? No, you want the opposite of that. Because at some level, you understand that you get what you pay for. And, and we want to attract the best, best, best talent to the nonprofit sector, the people that have track records of achieving very complicated things. I mean, just think about it for a second. What happens if you tell the nonprofit sector, find the people that are the cheapest to buy? Yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, you wrote a charity case, Uncharitable, and now you have Everyday Philanthropists, which I think we agreed is the schoolhouse rock version of Uncharitable. We're going to put a link to it in the description and we'll promote it on social. But what's the big takeaway here? Clearly, yes, it's a quick read. I love that, by the way, on your website, you say how long it takes to read your books. No one does that. I don't know where that came from, but thank you for telling me how long the read's going to be when I buy your book. Uncharitable is a wonderful book that everyone should take a look at. But The Everyday Philanthropist is relatively new and it's it's a digestible chunklet. And I will encourage as many people in the nonprofit sector to, to look at it. But what are the key things in there that make it stand out? What makes it a very compelling, you know, 40 minute read or 20 minute read? First of all, it fits in your pocket. It's a little bigger than your iPhone. It literally fits in your back pocket. It's got 32 little micro chapters. They read in about two minutes each. It'll take you an hour to read the whole thing. So an hour to seriously up your level of civic literacy to become a really solid member of civil society. It's plain spoken writing. There's no academic jargon in it. There are big clarifying graphics so that you can really easily understand nuance. My mother wrote an endorsement on the back of it. She said, this is the first thing Danny's ever written that I could actually understand. <laughs> and, and that's what I, I, I wrote it for the average person so that nobody would get put to sleep by it. And it'll teach you a completely way of thinking about changing the world. It'll give you a completely different way of thinking about the role that you can play in civil society. And it'll help you to see yourself as a philanthropist. You don't have to be a billionaire to be a philanthropist. In fact, that you can be smarter than a lot of the billionaire philanthropists. And like I said, yeah, it reads in an hour. You can refer back to it. You know, if you forgot something, you can send it to your friends and you can get that at danpilata.com. And then, you know, you talked about the bold training. You can check that out at the bold training. Dot com And those two things together, if you gave those to everyone on your staff and everyone on your board, you would change the conversation in a week dramatically. And I can attest to that. Dan Pallotta, husband, innovator, I would call you the, the renaissance man of renaissance men, fathering triplets <laughs> who are just turned 13. I have empathy. My, my twins just turned 10. So I'm, I'm kind of chasing you from behind. I'll, I'll uh, conclude by thanking you for a, being you and doing what you do. But your tagline from the 90s, human, kind, be both just sums you up the best way that it can be. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. Thanks for who you are too, Matthew. That's all for today, folks. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producer is Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Jen Horanjeff and Andrew McDowell. Darren Tun is our production intern. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Matthew Zachary. Our theme music is by the Mike Van Allen Quintet and by Mara. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make guest recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com. 